So when you type on the keyboard on your phone, you get these pop-ups that confirm that you've pressed that letter. These are a substitute for the physical feel of pressing a key on a real keyboard. And they're also needed because they need to confirm you that you typed the right letter, since phone keyboards are so small. But on both iOS and Android, the spacebar doesn't have this. It's explicitly turned off because it's the most used button and it would be annoying to have it pop up so many times. Plus, it's big enough not to make a mistake. So someone had to go in and manually program this in. See, this seemingly insignificant detail that 99% of people will never notice is just the start of this insane rabbit hole of what's happening behind the tech that you use every day. See, I've been building tech for a living for years. And because of this, I've been accumulating this weird niche knowledge of all the tricks, lies, and things that hide behind the tech that we use every single day. So today we're going to go deeper and deeper into the three levels of what's going on behind your tech. From the surface and the stuff that you see, to the thousands of little details that most never notice all the way to the insane and obscure design and engineering hiding deep behind even the simplest things that you do every single day. Now, a warning. There's a good chance this video might break a lot of the magic that makes your tech work and you start to overanalyze everything you see like a crazy person like myself, so you warn. Ready? Then let's start with the simplest thing ever. Level one, which is what you see on the surface. Take a look at this very video. The button to pause this video is a pause icon. And if we're paused, it becomes play. I mean, Duh, the icon represents what happens when you click. But take a look at Google Meet. Here, the mute and mute button icon is inverted. Right now, the microphone is paused and the icon is not the future state, it's its current state. This is one of the most sneaky problems in design, the two-state problem. This one user faced the same problem in this conferencing tool, where he panicked because he couldn't figure out whether the mic was active or not. So how do you solve this? Well, the best way is to separate the action and the status into two. For example, in the Tesla app, the lock icon represents the status of the car, and the button lets you switch to the other state and lock the car. Or you can use clear colors and shapes to represent a state, which is what the call screen on iPhone and iOS does when you mute your audio. Because behind what you see every day, there are so many things hidden in plain sight that make it all work. Take these three items. If I put them like this, they have no specific meaning. But if I just add some rounded rectangles and do this, now in 0.1 seconds, you immediately understand that skiing is active. And if you tap on one of the others, the content is gonna switch. Or what if I do this? Well, now in 0.1 seconds, you understand that skiing and volleyball are switchable, but biking is somehow separate and you might expect something different when you click it. And what if I do this? Now in 0.1 seconds, you immediately understand that these are tags, properties of some other element. And what about but now, in 0.1 seconds, you understand that these are toggles and you can turn them on or off. Notice that the actual content never changed, but just by changing what's around them, we can convey how something is supposed to work in 0.1 seconds. These are called design patterns, and they are what makes our technology usable without needing an instruction manual. For example, if I show you this, I don't need to tell you in some manual what it means. You already know that if you click on this, you're gonna see more options about something. Why? Because you've seen this hundreds of times already. The three dots is actually called an ellipsis, and it comes, well, from books, where if you have a list, the dots represent that there is something more in that list. But while in written text you can get away with two dots, in tech you'll always see three. Why? Well, because sometimes they're put vertically, for layout reasons. And if you have two, it would look like a colon. If you have four, it would be too cluttered for a vertical icon, so that's why it's three dots everywhere. But this was just scratching the surface, because when you actually look closer at all the details behind our tech, that's when you three really start to see how much hidden design, engineering and psychology hides in what we do every single day. And so, let's start typing. The typing cursor blinks to make it easier to find on the page while we are at rest and not typing. But as soon as I start to type, it doesn't blink anymore. If it did, it would be distracting so it stays solid. Now let's zoom into this email field. When you're typing your email on the internet, the text box checks whether you actually typed an email address or whether you made a mistake. If you're building this, what would you do? Well, anytime a letter is typed, you run the check and if what's in the text box is not valid, we throw an error. Well, this would be incredibly annoying because in this case, as soon as I start to type a few letters, a text box would scream to me that, hey, it's invalid. So in reality, to make this work, their check is actually run only when the user defocuses the text box, which means they're done typing, and that's when we show them that the address is incorrect. But if we need to validate a password field, for example, with a minimum length of characters, that's when running the check after you defocus would be annoying. And instead, that's when you need to do it anytime a letter is typed. These look like small little details, and 99% of people would never think about them. But they are what make the difference between a product 
that feels good and one that makes you want to throw your laptop out the window. And I love to find these small little touches. For example, many people use a dash and a greater sign to type an arrow, like this. But some engineers took the time to write a special case where if you have those two letters together, it replaces them with an actual arrow symbol. Just because... Why not? On YouTube, when you have replies to a comment, you can expand them through this toggle right here. But the toggle is intentionally made so it stays in the same place. And the new content appears below. Because our intent here is to quickly check the top replies and then close it. Not to add another 100 comments to scroll through. So with two clicks, I can open it and close it real quick. On Instagram, on the other hand, the button to collapse and uncollapse is under the comments. So when I uncollapse them, if I want to collapse them again, I need to scroll all the way down and click. This might seem like something insignificant. But with billions of daily users, this might be the reason why YouTube users might check more the replies because it's quicker and end up with more discussion in the comments. So if you take the calculator app on an iPhone with an OLED screen and you start to wiggle it around, you'll see that the gray buttons move weirdly, almost as if there's a lag. And this is the reason why in dark mode, the background of any website or app shouldn't be 100% pure black. See, on an OLED screen, black pixels just turn off and they take slightly more time to turn back on than just switching from one color to another. If you're watching this video from an OLED screen right now, you can see that two squares are actually moving together in reality, but it looks like there's some kind of wonky delay. So because of this, if you're building a dark mode app, you don't want to use pure black for your background, especially if you have scrolling content. Yeah, I'm looking at you. X. And the more you zoom in and look closer, the more you notice all the things you have to think about when building technology. This is Flask. It's my own company. It's a video collaboration tool, and this is where you type and record comments. But look at this glow radial gradient. It looks like crap. If you have gradients going from one color to another and the changing color is subtle, you get these blocky lines. This is called color banding. And it's because there are simply not enough colors to go from the start to the end color and make it look, you know, smooth. So let's do some magic and boom. Wow, this looks so much better. What happened? Well, to solve this problem, I had to stack four or five elliptical gradients on top of each other in order to make it seem even more smooth. Or for example, why do you think everything has become so rounded? Back in the day, everything in tech was very like rectangular with pointy angles, but today we see a lot of circles, even just too much rounding all around. So what's the deal with this? Other than the fact that it was just harder to make rounded corners in the 80s, something sharp is associated with danger, blades, weapons, something that will cut you, that will hurt you. If you go in nature, there's not going to be many like perfectly angular things. So rounding up elements makes them feel more approachable, less threatening, more playful. Even looking closer at something as simple as your home screen reveals something more. Apple app icons are not rounded rectangles. They're a different shape called a squircle. It's an in-between shape between a circle and a square. And they use it because it's a much more natural shape. There's something more organic about it. And yes, now the entire Apple UI, including the actual rounded corners of the iPhone, are all squircles. So the ADHD people at the design department can have everything nice and concentric and fully aligned. Not gonna lie, it looks good. But remember, we are still at level two. And now that we descend to level three, that's when you'll see how much complexity and nuance is behind the tech you use every day. But before that, see, there's a rule on the internet, which is also true here on YouTube. 90% of people are just consumers. 10% comment and engage. And 1% of people are creators. These are the ones that get their hands dirty. Those that build and try and experiment, and they might be the 1%, but they're the ones that end up changing things for the other 99%. So take a look at this. This is the sponsor of this video, Snapchat's Lens Studio. Some of you might remember the yellow hat I used to wear in my videos a few years ago. Well, check it out. Just a few clicks and I've created a Snapchat real-time AR filter with the hat. And voila, now it's a lens available for everyone on Snapchat to use. But what got me really excited about Lens Studio is something different. Yes, I can easily create lenses, even create them with natural language just by chatting. But look at this. Now, some people might be overwhelmed by this, but if you're a builder of tech like myself, you also had your eyes light up when you saw this. Because Lens Studio is a fully fledged, incredibly powerful platform to build augmented reality experiences and really go as deep and as complex as you want. Developers have built entire complex games, different kinds of aesthetics and lenses used by millions in Lens Studio. And the reason I'm excited about Lens Studio is because it's built exactly for creators. Just download Lens Studio for free and start creating. 
It's available both on desktop and on iOS, and you can find the link here in the description. But let's go back to the video, and let's descend down to level 3. But how interactions that seem simple and obvious hide insanely complex systems. Whoa, 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 wait. Yeah, I know, this is just zooming in and out on Google Maps. But let's slow this down to see what is actually happening behind the scenes. Of course, when I am zoomed in, there is a lot of detail about what's in this area. But watch what happens when I zoom out. The map zooms in and out, of course. But the text and icons stay the same size. So there's actually an algorithm that runs to check whether two pieces of text on the map, or two icons, actually overlap, and makes it so that it never happens. And no, it's not just dependent on the zoom level, but it needs to change dynamically for example, depending on how long the name of a place is. Now, when two places collide, they are hidden. Well, look what happens when I zoom out. Some of these places stay visible because they are algorithmically more relevant to me. So there's an algorithmic system that defines in real time which places are more relevant at this time in Tokyo and keeps them show even though we are zoomed out way past their level. But that's not all because you can see that there's also hierarchy. For example, historical sites and landmarks have more hierarchy than other local elements like you see here with Imperial Palace. Alice. But there's more. When I am zoomed in, the street names are white because there's actually enough gray asphalt around them to create contrast with the text. But when I start to zoom out, first they invert their color so that they are more visible against the smaller road and then they disappear. But if you notice, there's also a hierarchy in the names of all geographical areas. For example, this Chiyoda city neighborhood has higher priority over everything around it and it keeps getting shown even when I'm way zoomed out. But if you look closer, there's even more stuff. There is one exception to the never overlap rule and that's your pinned locations because since we need to show them all because you know that's kind of the point they are an exception and they are allowed to overlap each other behind something so simple like zooming in and out of a map there's an incomprehensible amount of work and systems that are all going on in real time behind the scenes and if all of this works you never notice and it looks like they had so much fun doing this that they even did things that they didn't need to. For example, if you zoom way out, you can actually see the orange shade of the sunrise and sunset on the Earth. And when I shared this on X, an engineer from the Google Maps team replied to me saying that even the stars in the sky, when you zoom all the way out, are accurate. They are not just some random star's background, they are correctly showing actual constellations. But there's even simpler things that show how much technicality there is behind what you use. When you look at your photos in Google Photos, for example, it groups them by day, pretty standard. But watch here. These are photos from a recent night out in Tokyo, and if you look at the time, they've been taken at 1.24 a.m. on Saturday, but they are grouped together with the Friday photos, because someone at Google took the time to build a grouping system that actually keeps your night out photos under the starting day, only to make it feel a little bit more human. No, this is not only crazy, but also potentially dangerous. See, here on X, we have a link that hasn't been clicked yet. But if on that page, we put a timer that shows how long that page has been open for, it looks like it was already open before we even clicked on it. This means that X opens the page in full, in the background, before you even click on it, so that when you click, it's already preloaded and pre-rendered, and it takes way less time to show. And while this is good for speed, I don't know how comfortable I am with having web pages load on my phone without having even clicked on them. See, all these seem like just technical rabbit holes, stuff that might save the company some time or some money, but no, when they are not there, you definitely notice it. There's a reason why some apps feel slow and some feel super snappy and fast. It's called optimistic updates. The way basically all apps work is that you have an action and the app has to send some data, like for example, posting a tweet from your device to the X servers and then back. And only then it confirmed that it's all good, it's safe. So while this happens, you have spinning wheels or in the worst case, you just have things that happen like a second late. But there are apps that feel so responsive and immediate. So what's the difference? Are they not saving stuff? Well, they use optimistic updates where the app is optimistic and just assumes that the action was processed correctly. So it updates the UI instantly, does the whole server thing in the background in parallel, and only tells you when things go wrong. By the way, this is how auto-saving in Google Docs works. But there's something else behind your tech that's not about how it works. It's the story of how, for the past 10 years, Silicon Valley took the fun and playfulness of our tech and destroyed it. How Silicon Valley killed fun. But also how now we are starting to go back to the crazy and weird times of tech. And you can find all about it in this video right here. I'm Enrico, and I'll see you in the next one.